Welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to another edition of the Lockdown. Um, this is our first edition in English. Uh, we've been doing the show for several weeks now in Dutch. Um, but we'll also have some shows in English um, because apart from discussing all the social and political ramifications of this crisis in the Netherlands, we find it very important to hold up an internationalist perspective. And to practice international solidarity, um, we need knowledge and discussion of the situation in different communities and different places across Europe and across the world. Um, so we'll kick off this um, international edition uh, today with an Italian comrade and personal friend of mine from Florence, uh, Lorenzo Alba. Welcome, Lorenzo. Hi, everybody. Hi, Ellen. So, I'll give a short introduction. Lorenzo is uh, originally from Puglia, the southern tip of, uh, of Italy. Uh, but for the past decade uh, has mostly been living, working, studying and struggling in Florence, uh, where I met him. Um, uh, he also worked in Marseille in France for a year. Um, but I want to talk to Lorenzo, not just because um, Italy is the place where the crisis hit Europe uh, the first and maybe the most dramatic, uh, where the health crisis hit very hard and brought the um, seriousness and the urgency of this crisis uh, home to Europeans. Uh, because, but also because Lorenzo is, uh, is very knowledgeable on a wide range of topics, uh, both on an intellectual level um, and also on a practical grassroots level. He's been organizing in worker struggles uh, and political groups uh, tirelessly for his uh, entire adult life. Um, and he currently works as a historian doing his uh, PhD on the educational policies and ideas of the Italian Communist Party. He's also active in Portera al Popolo, uh, a group that has emerged on the Italian left in the past years and that we'll talk a little bit more about uh, later. So Lorenzo, before we get into everything uh, about the political and economic situations, first off, how are you doing personally? You've been locked up in your house mostly for the past two months and I understand that now things have, uh, the measures have slowly but surely um, been eased. So since Monday you've been allowed to go outside a bit more often, I understand. Yeah. Uh, of course, I'm very happy to hear you and uh, to hear your very beautiful presentation you uh, did uh, and bit for me. Um, it was very difficult, of course, to face the, the lockdown. Uh, I was very uh, disoriented in the first moment. I, I was alone in my house, so I I just felt that I could no couldn't go out and uh, I I was paradoxically very busy because uh, I continued working as my PhD but I was uh, totally submerged by phone calls friends calling parents calling all the people was very very worried so it was very very uh, difficult to stay. Uh, closer. I think uh, all of the Italian people uh, felt a little bit, a little bit of what the prisoners in jail feel. So we start adapting slowly to this new life and uh, uh, giving us uh, new times of living. Some very strict rules because when you are in jail, you have to put some rules to your life. But uh, now I'm very good. I mean, uh, I adapted I, I i can go out the spring outside so um i'm fine thanks yale for uh, for this question yeah and i think even though the situation in the netherlands was obviously not as strict in terms of the lockdown not nearly as strict uh, all those uh, mental processes sound very recognizable for um, for many of us across the world i think so moving from the personal to to the current situation in Italy. Um, could you just to start off with give us a, a brief update on, on what the current situation is, both in terms of the health crisis, but also in terms of the economic consequence of the crisis? Um, just, to, just to start us off. Yeah, uh, I'll try to be not so long. It's now the, the contagion is decreasing. You can you can see, of course, in the newspapers also in Holland, but there are some regions of Italy, above all Lombardia, uh, which is the most industrialized uh, region, uh, we, where the, the, the contagion is decreasing very, very slowly. Um, most of the enterprises reopened, but not all the people know if they go to work. 
uh, because a lot of enterprises uh, will uh, cut uh, the time, work time. There will be a lot of people who are uh, who are precarious, will not go back to work. To have uh, uh, the the major the, the uh, to understand how uh, enormous was the, the economic uh, lockdown. Uh, uh, just I have to tell you that we have uh, 23 million uh, of people uh, workforce and 13 million asked for some form of help to the state. So um, a lot of people uh, lo lost uh, a good part part or uh, the total of uh, uh, their income during this period and a lot of these people now uh, they're just facing unemployment so that's that's what happened uh, but as you said from Monday a lot of enterprises uh, they will uh, they are reopening so let's see what happens in the next days in terms of unemployment and economic crisis uh, they say that we will lose 10% of the uh, internal products, so we don't know GDP, we don't know how much it actually will be. Uh, we know that the schools, uh, so all the public instruction, uh, universities, schools, uh, will reopen in September. We still don't know in uh, which form they, they, they will do. Uh, the government says that maybe half of the kids will stay at home, half of the kids will stay in schools. Uh, they all, what we know is that they're trying to uh, always to try to find the cheapest solution. That's what's happening now in Italy. Yeah. Yeah, and, and that's... Um... I guess that's that's part of the the deeper question I want to ask as well, because looking at Italy from from the Netherlands, I guess from the rest of Europe, I mean, in the first couple of weeks there was intense focus on what was happening in Italy, um, less so now. Um, now that the the crisis has engulfed other countries as well. Um, so at the beginning, in the first couple of weeks, we saw, you know, on the one hand, some beautiful examples of of community connection um, within uh, from Italy. Uh, most notably, of course, through the balcony scenes of people playing music or singing um, songs or bella ciao together. Um, but the crisis also, from what I understand, has um, deepened many divisions that were already present within Italy. Uh, so Rosa Gilbert, a comrade we both knew, uh, know, uh, wrote about this last week in a, in a great overview article that we'll um, link to in the show notes below and that I recommend everyone to read. And she document, documented, amongst other things, how uh, Confindustria, one of the main business lobbies, successfully uh, both delayed the calling of the lockdown, so at the beginning, uh, yeah. and now subsequently uh, kept many workplaces open, um, forcing millions of workers to risk their lives uh, at their workplace, even though some of these um, uh, workplaces did not seem essential by any means. Yeah. I know you and Potera al Popolo uh, have been active politically as well during this crisis situation, and uh, we hope to draw lessons from from the um, from your experiences there. Um, before we get into those details, can you first give the uh, viewers a, a brief overview of uh, your political yeah. group, Potera al Popolo? Uh, how was it formed, and what are its main activities? What is Potera al Popolo? Potera al Popolo is a political movement which was born during the uh, 2018 elections, general elections. It uh, rose up rose from the union of several grassroots movements. Uh, nowadays it has like uh, 7,000 uh, 7, members, uh, several uh, like uh, 40 people's houses, we call them, uh, in all the country. Uh, they are uh, mutualistic places where we try to give help on, for workers, poor, and popular classes. And uh, it's a very little organization, but nowadays it's one of the biggest organization of the left. And uh, this because uh, we have most, uh, we have a very very uh, little left in Italy nowadays, so that's why we are the biggest, the biggest organization, of course. 
Yeah, yeah. Uh, we'll, we'll get into the political landscape of Italy uh, in a bit more detail okay. later as well. Um, so what what has Potera al Popolo and what have you been doing during this crisis? I mean, also for us from here, you know, it's been very disorienting to figure out what we can do when we're mostly confined to our houses. Um, but you've been able to do something. So what kind of worker struggles or solidarity initiatives have, have been uh, happening? So the, the first thing we did was, of course, trying to uh, keep in contact with, uh, with our people. So uh, we, we invented some new forms of uh, assistance. We, in our people's houses, we have uh, uh, assistance, free assistance for workers. We try to uh, be useful for struggles on workplaces. So we tried to do it uh, with our, uh, in the new situation, with our phones. So we put up a call center, a national call center, where uh, workers were, uh, uh, I don't know, were uh, fired or uh, the, the owner was uh, putting them on rest uh, just because they were, uh, uh, they, there was the, 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 the economy was not going well, of course. So they were calling us and we, are, we were trying to assist them. In this way, we started to, to see that there was, uh, the people, of course, they were very, very uh, scared by the virus in the uh, workplaces. So what happened is that for where Confindustria, which is the owner's uh, trade union, union they uh, decided to keep uh, to push the government to keep uh, some of the uh, economic activities open while the virus was spreading very, very rapidly. The workers, they decide, they, they put their uh, right to life uh, before uh, the, the right of the, the, the property of the owners, the right of the owners. And so they decided to get on strike very spontaneously in some workplaces and in some sectors, uh, grassroots unions, but also the biggest, uh, more moderate unions, they, in some sectors, they uh, got on strike just because workers were asking it in order to defend their right uh, to life. So uh, we tried to give a voice to this movement which was going on, of course, the government and uh, uh, closed some of the uh, industrial sectors so this moving movement disappeared disappeared but but there is still today some kind of um, fear and of willing to protect themselves of course the, the other very important thing we did is trying to help uh, the people who were totally abandoned from the institutions in this uh, situation. I mean, there were a lot of people who just lost their income. They started, uh, they didn't know how to eat. So we started uh, making food delivery, free food delivery for these people uh, in, the, in the towns. We can do this because the voluntary activities are permitted also during the lockdown. So we were going out with all the measures of security, of course. Uh, and we tried to uh, help these people uh, collecting money from uh, solidarity we were using the crowdfunding, internet and so on, and giving uh, food to poor families. And for poor, poor families, I mean, also normal workers who just lost their job, lost their income, they uh, didn't access to uh, have access to state um, um, salaries, uh, money for people who lost their job. Uh, we also try to organize this service for uh, old people or uh, people who were more fragile uh, concerning the virus in front of the virus, or old people or people who had some problems, health problems, and we start to bring these people uh, courses uh, at their uh, home. So 
in just over helping them in order not uh, them to have to go out from their home homes so these these, these are some examples of what uh, during the, the crisis uh, what are popular but also a lot of uh, popular solidarity uh, did in this uh, period when we talk about popular solidarity you mean and just movements that sprung up spontaneously almost yeah uh, or spontaneously or uh, where uh, there there is a social environment uh, with uh, i don't know little uh, associations or uh, just yeah. uh, maybe the church sometimes also the church uh, the local church were doing this or uh, just neighborhoods in which in little villages where the the people knows uh, each other very well so yes it depends by the, the, the environmental situation of course yeah i understand so that brings me i guess to the question um throughout europe and the world there's been a lot of focus on all kinds of um, economic support packages that governments have passed uh, that vary uh, across the world um, quite dramatically was there anything like this in italy what kind of governmental support uh, have, have the people been given is there any uh, income support, any like state wel- welfare that people could easily reach? From what it sounds like, there were a lot of people who were sort of left out of, of any help from the government. Okay, <coughs> sorry, I tried to say it in English. Uh, yes, uh, we didn't have a lot of support from the government. I mean, uh, they they blocked uh, in the first moments like four hundred millions of euros, but this money was already there uh, they just were deblocked and given before the time to the municipalities to give some uh, food to the poor people uh, and new poor of course but this money finished very very quickly so uh, now the government uh, the, the government did some very sectorial uh, uh, help from pe- for people, for workers who were ex- excluded by the traditional welfare, uh, we call it casa integrazione, uh, welfare salary for the people who are uh, uh, unemployment salary, let's say this. Yeah. And then, um, now, a day, now in, this, in these days, uh, the government is trying to put on a new, a more universal uh, wealth measure which is called uh, emergency income something like this we are asking to for the government to do this because there is a big part of the population which for many reasons in migrants people who doesn't uh, are who were uh, erased from the list of the residents uh, workers who works in, uh, in the black, I uh, don't know what to say, but who the doesn't have market, it, yeah. in the black market, but it's a lot of people in the touristic chain. There's, there's a lot of people who just are not registered who doesn't have contracts. So all these people, we are talking about millions of people, they uh, just uh, don't have uh, nothing now. And this kind of uh, emergency income could reach also these people which nowadays is just surviving thanks to the solid, popular solidarity. Yeah. So, but uh, there is a class struggle in the government now to, because, uh, of course, the Europe allows us to make uh, more debt. debt. Uh, we can spend more than the 3% that normally we, we can spend. But the problem is that, uh, of course, the uh, owners want uh, a, large, a big part of this share. Uh, and the, the workers, the normal people, uh, want the other part. So in the government, there is like uh, a part of the government which looks uh, wants to help more with the owners and is trying to to say that the uh, emergency income is immoral because you are uh, helping workers who uh, are working in the black market, like if working in the black market was uh, the existence of a black market and the existence of 
uh, people who works with that contract is, uh, of course, um, uh, how do you say, called part. Their fault. It's the fault. It's their fault. It's not like this. Yes. If we can zoom in on the uh, situation of, of migrants and especially refugees in Italy for a sec, because there are huge numbers of, of migrants um, locked in Italy, um, which is a European crisis uh, that Italy and Greece are often uh, forced to deal with. And these these people are there in often precarious situations, uh, locked with large numbers of people in into small houses. Um, and I presume politicians have not been very forthcoming in offering support to them. And I presume many of them don't even exist for the state. They're not registered. Um, so what is their situation? And they're also mainly surviving by um, popular support or... Yeah, um, what's happening is that, of course, government, as for uh, poor Italian people, they didn't do uh, a lot, they didn't do nothing. Most of the people we are helping are migrants. Uh, and when I go to the, the places to deliver food, 90% uh, of the people I help are migrants. Um, what's happening? Uh, in Italy is that there was a little bit of debate about the regulars uh, because uh, a lot of these people is working in agriculture in uh, southern Italy. Uh, what happened is that uh, because there was a lack of uh, workers due to the fact that a part of the workforce is, uh, is a stagional one, uh, so this means that uh, some of these people is coming from Romania for the season and they, they go back. Uh, because of the lockdown, most of these people, uh, in the first moments, they could not come in Italy. So uh, the government was very scared that there was a lack of workforces in, uh, in the fields to pick up our tomatoes, to pick up our, uh, our uh, potatoes and so on. So what happened uh, is that for uh, like a week, uh, the minister uh, of the, the work, uh, the work means, I don't know how to say in English, but anyway, you understood. Uh, this, this person, uh, Teresa Bellanova, uh, starts saying, maybe we have to regularize migrants. Of course, of course, they knew that there were a lot of irregulars, people who were, who were exploited with that contract for two hours, two, uh, two euros per hour, three euros per hour, but uh, until now, they didn't they just didn't give a shit. Just now they understood that maybe if we don't regularize these people, if we don't uh, put better conditions in the fields, maybe we won't have a lack of workforce to uh, pick our tomatoes. What happened is that they just didn't do this. They just, uh, for, for the instance, they just keeping uh, going like in the past. So we don't have uh, an amelioration of the situations in the work fields and we of course don't have an amelioration for in the life of these migrants uh, only popular solidarity in this moment is helping the migrants and the assistance uh, uh, for the refugees uh, for the, the, the first assistance which is uh, uh, given by the state but of course also also in this sector the situation is not very good because a lot of uh, of workers in the first assistance they just uh, were not going to work uh, because of the lockdown so uh, migrants were forced to leave uh, refugees were forced to leave many of them in the little houses in uh, uh, with the risk of uh, higher, higher risk of contagion uh, so that's the situation in Italy now yeah yeah I'm sure they have much higher risk I mean something we see throughout this crisis, especially the US, we have a lot of numbers uh, for that, how um, the virus uh, affects the uh, African-American community uh, at much higher rates than, um, than white population, just because they're just locked in much worse conditions, um, health-wise and living-wise. Uh, and I'm sure the same is the case in Italy uh, with, with refugees. Um, and I think we very much need to emphasize uh, as well the, the European responsibility for this. Um, the whole refugee crisis uh, is often centered in Italy and Greece, uh, but is very much yeah. a European responsibility. Uh, 
and so I want to continue to turn to this international dimension um, of, uh, of the crisis, in particular within the Eurozone. So the European Union, uh, and in particular the Dutch government, has steadfastly refused from the beginning to help out Italy, and then also other countries that are suffering, suffering the worst. So the Dutch government refuses to acknowledge the huge benefits on the one hand that it draws from the current makeup of the Eurozone system, uh, in which it siphons off huge amounts of money from the southern states each year. Um, and now even in this crisis wants to punish Italy for its financial difficulties that are in part the result of the, the Eurozone system. Uh, and they're trying to enforce serious budget cuts on Italy uh, and especially on social welfare spending. We, we just discussed that uh, there was very little government support in Italy for the people that are suffering um, the worst. Uh, and one of the reasons to um, raise money uh, in Europe as a whole uh, was in order to help people in Italy. But the Dutch government's main point of contention uh, was that they were afraid, supposedly, that this money would go to social welfare uh, spending yeah, in Italy and that this would continue uh, beyond the crisis. They were okay with money being sent via emergency funds to businesses, but they didn't want it to go to social welfare in Italy. It's really sickening. And I think, especially for people in the Netherlands, it's important to hear um, from someone in Italy, how you view all this? How is this viewed within Italy? Um, what is your position on this as Potere al Popolo? Uh, for instance, I understand that um, as Potere al Popolo, you're not particularly in favor of uh, euro bonds um, that the Italian government was asking for. Uh, but obviously, we need some type of European solidarity um, uh, support. So what, what is your position on this? What uh, Italian people understood is that nowadays Europe, for the people, at least for the people, is only a geographical uh, expression. But politically, there has been, until now, uh, no solidarity. It's very funny what the Dutch government is saying. I mean, uh, uh, the Dutch government uh, built uh, actually a fiscal haven in Holland. This means that a lot of enterprises, they just don't pay taxes uh, here and uh, don't pay taxes in Italy. Uh, so they can, they don't, uh, we don't benefit of uh, all the income that we uh, make to these people uh, that these people makes this is very very of course very very bad for us and uh, when the Dutch government says that we have to do it by ourselves is very very funny because it's, uh, they, they stole a lot of money to us so what we ask Dutch people it's of course help us of course uh, push your government and uh, try to uh, build Build a real solidarity in Europe, and uh, I, for solidarity, I mean just we need we need money, we need resources to go on and to pay uh, the social uh, uh, to, to make the people survive. This th this is what we need now. Of course, Dutch government is saying something that there there is something true in what Dutch government says. I mean. Italy is not a poor country. Italy has uh, 10 uh, trillions uh, of euros of uh, private uh, wealth. Mm -hmm. This means that all this wealth uh, is, of course, inequally distributed in the population. I mean, we have like uh, 500,000 families which are uh, millionaires okay so we have like two millions of people which uh, are very very are very rich this means that uh, we have to take a part of this income which is of not of course not an income a wealth which came from uh, exploit uh, exploiting people who were more precarious in the last 10 years uh, which were uh, which comes comes from uh, the big uh, I don't know I don't know how to say in uh, in English but uh, the, the the fact that all these people they don't pay all the taxes they should pay 
Yeah. Uh, okay, we have like uh, every year something like 140, 170 million billions of tax evasions in Italy. Uh, most of the evasion comes from uh, enterprises. So we have uh, this wealth, of course, is our money. I mean, is uh, wealth produced by the Italian workers, but who has been privatized by these people? We ask the government to put a tax on these people and to try to uh, use this money to, of course, of course, give some benefits to the poor people, but also to finance uh, a total uh, recon uh, ecologic, I don't know, reconversation, how do you say this tra transition in Italy? Because yes. we have- Ecological transition. Yeah, we, because uh, Italy has too many little enterprises, which all, before the crisis, they were suffering a lot. Suffering, I mean, that they were living on debts. This means that uh, we cannot give money to these uh, enterprises just to restart the economical, uh, uh, just uh, like uh, helicopter money for enterprises just uh, to restart the, the economic system. This, the system will never start in this way. We need, we are asking the state to uh, nationalized parts of the economic system, the strategic uh, enterprises, the strategic sectors, and to use these uh, uh, sectors to reorient the economy towards uh, uh, a transition. We can do this now, of course. So we are we we would like to uh, build around this project a, a, at least a European solidarity. So to ask money to the other states, I think of course this won't happen. Even euro bonds that we don't like because they are new debt, we don't want to build new debt because we have a huge debt uh, nowadays. So adding new debt uh, it's not of course the solution. We will, we will just uh, put some problems on the new generations and uh, and that to, on our people. We, we want to build uh, a European solidarity, uh, which uh, stand, which um, try to redistribute the wealth from the rich to the poor, also at European level. We we sh we should what we should do is to try to keep it in contact to build maybe a conference with all the popular organizations of Europe to try to find. Uh, an emergency plan from for Europe in order to uh, try to find this money, to redistribute this money to all the the, the people, uh, to all to, to the states and to the people, and to try to make this economic transition. Because of course, also the the, the climate situation is one of the factors that uh, gave to the, the, the gave birth to the, the spread of the virus. Uh, it is, it is, uh, I, I hope you understood what they wanted to say. Yeah, no, I, I think we, we definitely did. Um, yeah, and the, the climate crisis is of immense importance and it's, it's hard to uh, forget about it at this moment. Noam Chomsky in recent interviews has been emphasizing that the corona crisis is horrible, it's really bad, but we'll survive it, but we won't survive the melting of the, of the polar caps. Uh, we need to tackle the climate crisis and in a way this is an opportunity to do so. Um, and I, I think um, that what you are talking about is, is the crucial question that all societies are uh, facing now, namely, how are we going to distribute wealth and power within our societies? If we continue on the same foot, this crisis is going to increase inequalities radically, um, but we need the exact opposite. And um, especially the longer this crisis uh, lasts, the more crucial this question becomes, because We've now been in it for several months, but um, from what what we understand now, it, it, it might take at least two years before any type of vaccine will be available. And even that is a very uh, positive es estimate. So we might be in some type of similar situation for years to come. We don't know exactly, but it's going to be a, a, a very serious crisis for a long time. Um, and so any talk about raising the debt level, uh, I, I read that Adam Tooze wrote that Italian debt 
is currently at 135% of GDP, but the crisis might raise it to 155%. Uh, but that wouldn't even be an outlier anymore because all debt levels uh, are, are rising rapidly. And I guess doing it through the form of euro bonds would have the only advantage that it's not unequally distributed anymore where Italy and Spain have to uh, bear the burden of, of higher interest rates and uh, a debt they can never repay anymore, but it's sort of burdened by the shoulders throughout Europe. Um, but uh, it would only be a very temporary measure. The real question is, is one of class struggle and um, power distribution in our societies. Um, I think uh, I understood what you said there. So let's maybe switch uh, back again to the situation within Italy and maybe also the impact of the, the European um, political situation on the situation in Italy. So I want to ask you to give us maybe a brief summary of the uh, Italian political landscape of the last couple of years, especially for people who haven't been following closely, you know, which parties uh, uh, are currently strong uh, how has the government divided and how has the left been doing? And then talk uh, also about how this crisis has affected these political dynamics and if the lack of European solidarity uh, has strengthened the far right and uh, anti European stances or Italian nationalism. Like the, the latest numbers that I've seen, uh, and we'll put them up on the screen as well, um, showed a drop uh, of support for Lega, uh, but most of that support seemed to have moved to the Brothers of Italy an even more extreme far-right organization. Yep. Uh, and according to uh, Rosa Gilbert's uh, piece that we'll link to again below, uh, it's in part because uh, because of Lega's role in mismanaging the crisis in, in Lombardia, where they are the governing party. Uh, yeah. But total support for the far-right electorally seems to remain around 40%. That, that's scarily high. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, I will give you a very brief uh, uh, landscape, uh, I will draw the landscape of Italy. Uh, so, the, um, we have uh, in the government now, uh, we have uh, the Democratic Party, which is a neoliberal party, uh, very similar to the uh, Socialist Party in uh, France, for example. So, it's, it comes from a, a leftist tradition, but uh, slowly it shifted uh, towards uh, liberal and neoliberal positions. Uh, this party is in uh, at the government with uh, the Five Star Movement. The Five Star Movement is nowadays uh, it has the biggest share in the, in the parliament now of seats. This is because uh, uh, the Five Star Movement it's a uh, populist uh, uh, party, which uh, uh, had uh, his uh, best, uh, his first uh, good election in 2013 due to the austerity measures. Uh, it's a party founded by a comic, uh, Grillo, and uh, it's a party which uh, uh, mixes far-right uh, issues like uh, racist, uh, anti-migrant issues like the, far right, the, the extreme right and uh, also uh, leftish popular uh, issues like, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, they are, uh, they want to delete all the neoliberal laws uh, for the workers in which the central left did in the past. Uh, they are, for example, for uh, uh, to, to go back to some public services to republicize a little bit to the welfare in Italy. Uh, what happened is that uh, uh, this government actually uh, is uh, facing a, a very extreme right opposition, which is very, very strong in Italy. Uh, you said well before, uh, they are around the 40% of the, the shares. And uh, they are trying to, of course, to say that uh, uh, they are doing uh, the, the same thing that Trump is doing in uh, in US. They're trying to attack China. They are trying uh, to gain uh, visibility uh, around uh, conspiracy theories about the virus and all this stuff. Uh, what happened uh, is that uh, the left 
I, I won't talk a lot about the left because the left, the real left, is uh, very, very little. Now we don't have uh, a strong left uh, in Italy. Also, the Repubblica is outside the parliament. So uh, the political country, the political uh, the parliament uh, is a parliament without the real left. We, are the, we have the government bloc and we have the far-right opposition bloc this week. So we are in a very bad situation politically because the political debate is, of course, poisoned by this situation. Uh, what happened is that uh, uh, Lega, which is the biggest extreme right party, uh, the Lega of Salvini, was ruling, as uh, Rosa Gilbert wrote, uh, some of the regions where the vi virus spread mostly, like Lombardia. Uh, they did a lot of mistakes. Uh, the biggest mistake was to uh, keep the factories going running while the virus was spreading uh, and all the scientists in Italy agrees that this was a big factor for the spread of the virus. Mm -hmm. We had the longest lockdown, we had uh, very very bad consequences, consequences just uh, due to this uh, uh, situation. What also what uh, the governor of Lombardia, which is a Lega man, uh, Fontana, did uh, he, he, he put uh, coronavirus, coronavirus uh, 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 heal people into uh, the houses for old people. We call the, we call them uh, uh, residential uh, assistance, as, uh, re, 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 assisted residences. It's, uh, yeah. it's, it's the, it's the these are the places where the old people uh, yeah, uh, care care centers. Okay, this is the word. Yeah. They they uh, they did uh, in, in Lombardia. They put the hill of coronavirus in these places with uh, the old people which were living there. There, of course, this uh, gave birth to the spread of the viruses in all the system of the RSA. Uh, I remember I forgot the word you said before, but you understood what I yeah. mean. And uh, a lot we had a lot of old people dying in these places. And they were, in the first moments, they were even not counted by the system. So, so they were not uh, dead by coronavirus, coronavirus. And uh, of course, this, uh, all these mistakes uh, made uh, the Lega uh, go down. But what's happening now is that all the network of fascists, neo-fascists in Italy, all the, all the media, mediatic system that these people in the, during the last uh, 10, 20 years, they built uh, in the social network, in the radios, in the newspapers, is trying to reorient the far right uh, consensus towards Giorgio Meloni and Brothers of Italy. This other party, which is also a uh, fascist party, is not a regionalist party like Lega, it's a nationalist party which is the, the son of the old neo-fascist movement, uh, Movimento Social Italiano, MSI, which is the inherited, uh, the heredity of uh, the legacy of fascism in Italy uh, during the First Republic, so during, uh, since uh, 1945 until uh, uh, the 90s, this was the neo-fascist, the big neo-fascist party in Italy. And uh, after the 90s, after the, in the Second Republic, uh, I would call it, uh, this party became uh, the nowadays brother of Italy. So that's a very bad situation, even because we don't have a leftish government. Of course, uh, the Governo Conte is a center-left government, but uh, it's not helping workers. It's very, very sen sensitive to the uh conf industria the owners union uh, uh demands so it's uh, it's not of course a popular government or something that uh helps the the people poor people so poor people maybe that uh, will uh, if if they are very angry there are sectors which are very angry with the government and of course they will uh, look at uh, some other parties to uh, for uh, to, to fight the government, and now the, the biggest party are the fascist one. So that's the situation. Yeah, very scary. 
Um, so basically the left, which is very small when we talk about the real uh, left, is not really succeeding yet or is not able to uh, capitalize on uh, the fuck-ups of the, of the far right in government um, and, and increasing the left support. Uh, we are, okay, I can give you some hope. Uh, I please, think... Please give us uh, some hope. <laughs> I think that uh, uh, the situation uh, from the common sense uh, point of view is not so bad. I mean, for the first time after a lot of uh, years, after a lot of neoliberal bullshit, they said us people is going again, is, is reconsidering the importance of public services. Uh, neither the government, neither the fascists, they of course want uh, the public service to come back. They of course want to go on privatizing and so on. So this is a good uh, point for our people. I mean, maybe there's no, uh, the, the, the parties of the leftist party or Spodar Popolo are uh, growing in this situation. I think Spodar Popolo is growing, is receiving uh, uh, the people uh, uh, we are uh, helping, they know us now. Uh, also, our social media are going well. But of course, we don't, we cannot uh, compete on this level with the fascist, uh, with the biggest part in Italy. What's happening is that the common sense is shifting to the left. So it's shifting towards uh, more public services, more state somehow, more more uh, uh, states, not just, uh, I mean, not just police, I mean, state in the economy, uh, public intervention in the, and driving the economy. There is uh, uh, also a new sense of solidarity, which spread out because, uh, of course, uh, when uh, around uh, everything is messing up, the people like Simo Whale was saying to try find a new kind of solidarity, a new kind of community uh, between them. And uh, uh, there, is, uh, th there has been for some, uh, for uh, one day, two days, uh, this spontaneous strike uh, I told you in the, in the first part of the interview, uh, which spread for the right of life in the factories. This is also new in this, it's a long time we don't see a uh, spontaneous strike like this. So I think that so these these were wildcat strikes, the, right? The people, what? These were Sorry. wildcat strikes, not called by yeah, not called by you, way, but organized by the workers from the bottom up. Sometimes wildcat strikes, sometimes uh, organized by unions, but anyway, they were mm. the unions were pushed by workers. I mean, I'm sure about this. So this means that uh, uh, if the government doesn't do what it has to do, and so. Uh, put money in social services, make the people uh, survive, uh, take the money from the, the, the someone else, from uh, uh, the rich. Uh, if the, the government w will go on uh, cutting social services, the, I think there will be a popular mo mobilization. That's what we can, uh, and that's where a left could uh, grew, grow up uh, rapidly and could uh, organize and maybe could uh, uh, could uh, give birth to a new a new organization uh, which is the sum of the existing organization. I don't know what up what will, what will happen in this case, but what uh, we hope is that somehow this situation will give birth to a popular mobilization in the next period. We don't know when, of course, but there are some aspects uh, and elements and factors which are positive in this sense. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that, that ties into the last point that I would like to talk to you about. And it's maybe not so much just within Italy, but just um, the question of leftist politics in general uh, for the coming years and the coming decades uh, during this crisis. Um, like on the one hand, uh, the crisis inevitably inevitably brings the state back in. So at least on the level of the state, um, decades of neoliberal cuts and less state spending on welfare and other public uh, provisions um, are now to a certain extent forcibly uh, reversed. Um, you know, to what extent will happen, we'll have to see, and it's part of, 
partly the result of, of how successfully we struggle for them. Um, but at least to some extent, uh, the state is forced to take a more active role in the economy again. Uh, and that's something that the left, of course, at least on the level of, of state and electoral politics, has been asking for for a long time. Um, and now perhaps can push to make more permanent again. Um, but on the other hand, um, crisis powers also give states uh, a lot of options for repression and breaking through barriers of privacy and repression that before yeah. would not have been accepted. No, um, like the use of Corona apps is one example. Um, uh, and these also can very easily become permanent, you know, um, all kinds of uh, uh, principles can, can become permanently uh, uh, embattled in our systems. And I think we, we don't have to go as far as Agamben, uh, a leftist political philosopher in Italy who has written a lot about states of exception, but uh, also during this crisis wrote several articles, which in my opinion were just crazy ramblings that basically came down to uh, coming out completely against any emergency measures and uh, talking about the need to accept death as part of life. And, uh, you know, I want to leave that to the side because I think that's crazy stuff that I don't even want to get involved in. Um, it, it's on par with sort of the far right protests in the US, but also here in the Netherlands that are just going out and calling for a complete reopening uh, of, the, of, the, of the economy. Um, but still, there are serious concerns. And uh, how do we as a left balance, balance these demands for state intervention, uh, protection of people's and workers' lives, and at the same time, guard against this abuse of power? Uh, because we are not, uh, as you said, also in Italy, we are not in a very strong state. It's not like we have a lot of influence over what's happening um, uh, in the state at the moment as a left. So how, how do you think about these, uh, these things? So um, I agree with you on Agamben, of course, and uh, yeah. I think that uh, uh, the virus exists. The people uh, fear for their selves, uh, for the people they love, to uh, they don't want them to get ill and to die. So they accept in uh, a most uh, in a more. Uh, uh, Easy way the, the, the government measures of above all the, the, the police on the streets, the fact that uh, they, con they can control you in every moment, and so on. Of course, state repressions try to use this uh, um, situation to uh, make the control on people stronger. Uh, this is natural, it's, it's, it's in their nature, okay, it's in the cops' nature to do this. What, uh, what we, ha we can do in this uh, moment is uh, trying to make the people and uh, to push uh, in, um, in some directions these, uh, these situations of control. I mean, it's true that there is uh, a danger that, uh, that that if the people they don't follow the rules, the contagion will spread. But we uh, physically, empirically uh, discovered that uh, where there were the enterprises opened without safety measures, the contagion spread uh, spread off in a very very fast way. So we say yes to more control. What we have to say as left is that it's not controlling if the people, they run alone around their home, uh, that you will keep uh, the people safe, but it's, con it's uh, controlling the if the enterprises which have to be closed are really closed, and they weren't, of course, it's controlling if it's that inside the enterprise the, there is safety there are safety measures for workers is pushing in this direction uh the willing of control which all the people wants uh, in order that the, the, the virus uh, not spread not spread off so uh what we can do in this moment is uh, this kind of uh, of stuff of course uh the government is not doing this or is trying to 
criminalize normal people, what normal people do every day, just to go around uh, uh, the 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 there the, the, the has been a, a huge polemic, huge uh, I don't know polemic, polemic, yeah, polemic yeah. about uh, the, the the people working on the street. Okay, yeah, the the creed, the, the the laws uh, which enforced the lockdown in Italy uh, allowed the people to go on the street once a day, twice a day, just for essential necessities, necessities, necessities like going uh, uh, to essential work or uh, to go out for to, to put the garbage inside a container or to go to out for courses. Yeah. What? Uh, but you can also you could also go for a walk around your house. This was the the law. The government, when the, the contagion spread in Lombardia in a very fast way, what the government uh, was saying to just to, to, to just uh, put the responsibility uh, far away from this decision to keep the industries, the economic activities open, is that uh, the, the, the government said, okay, the, all the it's uh, the people who works around their homes fault, okay. I, you didn't understand the yellow what I said. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, the government is as he was doing with the migrants before. Okay, no, the, the migrants are the people who steal our job, they rape our women, they kill, uh, they put, they bring crime in our countries and so on. Now all the social problems are shifted to the people who work around their home and not to the enterprises, not to the, of course, to the, the, the other stuff. So what we have to do is clarify uh, to our people that it's not our fault if, uh, if we respect, of course, the safety measures that uh, the, the spread of the virus, but it's fault of some uh, choices that have been made, uh, putting profit, profits before people. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. I think changing the terms in which we have these debates is is crucial. I mean, I, I also cringe when I walk on the street and I see some people really not um, listening to the measures that we have to take. And, uh, you know, it has some type of impact, but it, it pales in comparison to the, the much larger scale decisions of allowing people to go to work without protection um, just to keep businesses running. Um, and I think one of the, the biggest scandals um, in all of this for Europe uh, as a whole and the United States uh, has been the complete lack of preparations by states. We knew that the virus was coming. We were warned. Uh, but there was no large scale preparation whatsoever uh, in terms of measures, in terms of stockpiling tests, in terms of stockpiling piling protective measures, in terms of starting to produce these things. Uh, and I cannot help but think that this is connected to decades of neoliberal cuts and, and the gutting of uh, state bureaucracies. And it's really seriously impeded their ability to govern um, in any uh, sensible way. Uh, and now they're, they're trying to grab on and figure out uh, how to contain this crisis. But uh, if you look at the numbers for North America and Europe, they, they completely uh, win and to, to talk about to talk in american terms um over asia uh, and other continents uh, which have somewhat successfully contained the virus and uh our cases are through the roof and states yeah. are not able to seriously protect people and at this point in time don't even seem to try to do that anymore it's just about letting the virus spread slowly i think rather yeah. than still trying to contain it and then um opening up slowly and measuring, uh, um, sorry, tracing who was, uh, contact, who was, um, uh, contaminated with the virus and who they were in touch with. Uh, no, it's just letting it spread slowly and, um, live with the results, but the results are, uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of deaths. Yeah. Well, what uh, you, you're right that this crisis, uh, made us, uh, discover, uh, how our communities, uh, our uh, our 
welfare social state was has been destroyed literally destroyed by uh, decades of neoliberalism of privatization of cuts and so on and if you don't have the possibility to build a uh, test uh, mask for uh, the doctors uh, how can you face a virus like this how can you face a normal flu I, I we we talk about the emergency of the coronavirus, but every year in Italy, in the hospital, we have an emergency of, uh, for the normal, I don't know how to say, the, the flu. The, yeah, the flu, the influenza. The flu. It's, it's very, it's very the, the, the health system was already in emergency situations before the virus. When the virus came, uh, one of the categories which were of course more exposed were the sanitary workers the health workers doctors nurses and so on all these people uh, in the first moments they didn't receive any adapted uh, mask for the situation they because in italy we don't uh, we don't have uh, the, the, the sanitary system doesn't uh, buy abroad this kind of uh, stuff. Uh, but this cannot uh, work, of course. If you want to make the, the sanitary system work, of course, you have to have a public production of this uh, dispositive, uh, or at least a national production of, of, the, of this dispositive in order to have the possibility to, uh, to, have the, to make the health system work. Yeah. We, have, we had a lot of doctors and nurses which died for this for this reason, which uh, were uh, infected by the virus and just died. And this is not uh, not fair. And and uh, I think that after the big fear, someone will remember it. The, the left, of course, should repeat it uh, uh, without. Uh, um, stopping the, uh, what happened, but I think, I hope that the doctors and the nurses, the, the, the health workers of Bergamo, of Lombardia, will remember, will keep in mind what happened, and after the, the big fear, will get on strike and ask for invest, public investments and public uh, production uh, for uh, the health system, because this is the only way to rebuild some social system, rebuild some our communities and uh, rebuild the possibility for our uh, uh, people to to live uh, uh, to, to have a good life, to, to, to live well well and not to die for a normal flu. And that's what's happening in Italy now. Yeah, I completely agree. And um, I, I think there are still serious dangers though because you know, uh, politicians even even uh, amidst this crisis are still ta like in the Netherlands are talking about coming budget cuts in the healthcare sector. I mean, it's unbelievable. It's scandalous, but uh, it's happening, and it should be unacceptable. But I, I still fear that um, the left might be, as it has been in the past decade, on some issues outflanked by the right in terms of. Um, standing up from some type of uh, public measures um, and some type of public policy. And that will be you know, the biggest uh, danger if, if some mainstream leftist parties continue to be captured by a neoliberal dogma, we're going to come out of this crisis even worse and, and the far right is going to um, win even more. Uh, so I think definitely struggles in the healthcare sector are going to be uh, one of the crucial um, locations of battle uh, for the left in years to come. Um, so, yeah. Um, I don't know if you have anything to add to that. Um, I just uh, want, uh, want to thank you, uh, above all, uh, to listen to me, even if I really I speak a really bad English. And uh, I want to thank you, above all, because you give us the possibility to tell Dutch people uh, what uh, the government is not doing in this situation. Uh, it's uh, very important that we rebuild uh, European solidarity and uh, uh, I thank you, Jelle, for being so present in this moment. Thank you so much, Lorenzo. No, I think uh, 
it's us who uh, who want to thank you. Uh, you've been very insightful, and I think it's been uh, very helpful to talk to someone um, from Italy, uh, um, which, in a way, in Europe is still the center of this crisis. Uh, by the way, it's been struck, and by the way, the debate uh, is centered around uh, what's happening there. And um, yeah, I hope we can uh, continue to stay in touch and uh, be in solidarity and, and build up um, our movements to uh, to have a more uh, uh, lasting impact. Thank you so much for uh, for being with us. And, um, Thank you, Yele. And maybe if this crisis continues and the show will continue for sure, uh, we'll have you back uh, to talk about the next phase of the crisis. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll be very happy to do this for you.